Hello, dear friends. Don Langman and I are very happy to be with you today. This morning, this night, this afternoon, wherever you are. And I'm so happy, Don, that you are with us. You are in Adelaide, Australia. It's early in the morning. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity, Theodore. I heard from you that you are uh, an actor which is leading a school which is teaches the Chekhov methodology of the, the psychological gestures and doing the creative speech formation exercises or teaching as well. So you are in a way combining two worlds and then you are even bringing in a third world, the Eurythmy, into your work. And from what I learned, very, very su successfully, you wrote books about that, you run a school. Dawn, what brought you to walk on this path? And what were your first steps which brought you into acting? Well, um, yes, that goes back a long way. And of course, the, when I look back at those first steps at the time that they happened, I didn't necessarily know where they were leading. In fact, I didn't know at all where they were leading. But I look back now and I can experience that, um, yes, there was one very specific moment that was the seed point for me uh, later on recognizing that this was my path, was to be an actor. And uh, that moment happened when I was about 14 in school. And it was my first meeting with Shakespeare and we were reading The Merchant of Venice in the classroom. It was a terrible classroom reading, of course, with nobody understanding a word that they were reading, but we'd all been given parts and we were having to read the play aloud over the whole year in school. And um, I was in a very black period of my life, as one often is in adolescence. I was very, very depressed and live, lived really in a complete state of... Um, uh, blackness, I can say, an inner blackness. And I started reading, I was given the part of Shylock, and I started reading these words. And even though I didn't really understand intellectually a lot of what I was reading, I had this experience that through the language of Shakespeare, uh, well, what, what, what I felt I experienced was that a being came towards me through those words. And the only way I can describe it now, I mean, I couldn't articulate it at the time, but I had the experience that a being of love came towards me through those words. It was as though the words opened a portal and through that portal, I experienced a being of love that I felt understood all human experience. I felt there was a being in the world who understood all the human experience and could name that experience. And that being was my friend. From that moment on, I felt no matter what terrible things happened in my life, as they happen in everybody's lives, um, all the challenges and, and so on and the ordeals that one passes through, I always felt that this presence was with me the presence of this friend who could embrace all human experience and that it was possible to actually understand that human experience. And um, this for me, I guess, was a seed point that, that gradually has expanded and deepened and, and um, grown branches and finally borne fruit really through the whole of the rest of my life. So I suppose I would say now looking back that I see that the seed that was planted in that moment and which I've spent the rest of my life trying to follow the pathways that would enable me to actually be able to um, be a channel for that being, that being of love, uh, that that was the, the starting point of it. How conscious was it to you that you would walk tried to walk the path of acting already then? No, it wasn't conscious at all. I, I didn't have any sense at all that that, that that would be where it would lead me. But then the things that opened up in my life um, gradually sort of 
all flowed into that initial experience and 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 gradually i was yeah the pathways of my life opened up to to lead me into that um into that path of becoming an actor and but my my search was always uh because i went through a mainstream training in acting first of all and it was i don't want to denigrate that at all it was a very wonderful path in many ways but it was also rather dangerous i felt um, my first experiences in the art of acting were very much through the stanislavski methodology or the method as it was called and um i guess the wonderful thing about that was that it it was it enabled me to actually penetrate into my own soul life which i was very unconscious of i i didn't really know or i didn't really know how to to know what i myself felt about many things but when i when i approached them through a character i could feel dimensions of human experience that um that i didn't feel able to access in my ordinary everyday life but at the same time it was rather dangerous because um that that uh, stanislavski method as it was called which was based on really excavating your own personal psyche um but without a context within which to understand especially the the really darker emotions that were often called up especially when you played darker characters like lady macbeth or phaedra or whatever where you had to really explore the psychological depths of these characters that were very lost in the dark aspects of themselves and there was no there was no way of um defending myself against all of that arising up in me through the methodology through the acting through the stanislavski method and then not knowing what to do with it not it was very frightening and so i had some very frightening experiences and i suppose that also then um but it, it it always it always felt to me as though there must be another way as though there there must be a way that would enable you to penetrate the depths of human experience even the shadow the terrible shadow aspects of our of our journey on the earth that we have to go through because we're here on the earth and we have to experience all of those things and yet there must be a way to be able to experience them without doing damage to yourself which of course happens to many actors and um many actors do end up doing damage to themselves because they have to constantly access that darker side of human nature but they're not how how old have you how old have you been then when you were to this stanislavski method when you did this oh well i guess i started working with that and my first classes with that were already not not too long after that time that i described of reading the part of shylock in class so from about 14 15 years of age i started to have acting lessons and um with wonderful teachers uh, i always feel such gratitude to all the teachers that i had they all um you know contributed a very important part of my artistic journey but there was always that search for a greater context yeah. that would that would be able to hold all of those things in a way that was not damaging so what made you decide to look for another path or what 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 helped you to find another step from there well i guess i'd reached a point in my um by that time i was teaching in my early 20s i was teaching um drama and acting and speech uh and also doing a lot of performing here in adelaide and um i guess i'd sort of become i i didn't know that there was a pathway i just felt that i'd reached the end of of what i felt able to do and i thought i was actually saying goodbye to um the world of theater and drama and acting because i didn't know how to sustain it within myself in a healthy way and um and then i um through other experiences which i don't need to go into here i um was introduced to rudolf steiner's work and i read the speech and drama lectures and immediately i 
sense that here, here was a way. I mean, I didn't know that there was a training or that there was anything. I was just reading the lectures, but because I, at that point I was lecturing in speech and acting at what was then called Adelaide Teachers College. And I, I um, immediately started experimenting with the poor, my poor students. Well, my poor students all through my life, they've always had to be my guinea pigs for my next level of research. And so there I started in a very, in a very intuitive way, just taking up the examples that Steiner gave in the speech and drama lectures of working with the consonants and, and um, the vowels. And I, I just started experimenting with the students without knowing what I was doing, but feeling that it was something that was leading me further. And I felt it was leading me further and further. And eventually, of course, it led me to, uh, to cut a long story short, it led me to England and uh, where eventually I did the, uh, the speech training in London with Maisie Jones, uh, the London School of Speech Formation. So that was um, the next part of the jigsaw puzzle. And then the third part of the jigsaw puzzle came when after finishing the speech training, which was the most wonderful, you know, opened the portals into the heavens and, and everything that I'd been longing for through the art of speech um, came flooding in, but I didn't know how to integrate that, what was, um, what I would now articulate as being the, the knowledge of speech that came through Rudolf Steiner, bringing the lawfulness from the other side of the threshold. I didn't know how to integrate that with an acting technique, which was firmly rooted in this side of the threshold. And so again, I, I spent many years teaching and performing, trying, trying, well, performing as little as possible, actually, because I, I did feel very inadequate to be able to find this new way, but I did have to do some performing, but I was always trying to integrate this new path of speech with the old path of acting and gradually realizing that there was a limit there was a limit to how far it could go. And it was at that point that um, through somebody who came to work with me, Diane, who may be watching this interview. Hello, Diane, if you are. Um, Diane, um, who is now back in New York, um, teaching at Adelphi University. Diane came to do the speech and drama course that I was, um, again, experimenting with, with my poor guinea pig students at Emerson College and she had worked with the Chekhov work and she gave some wonderful introductory lessons to the Chekhov work and as soon as I experienced that I thought ah oh, this is this is the way that the acting process and the speech process can actually integrate it felt to me like that they were two halves of the one coin and I I couldn't actually believe that they'd ever been separated it, it just seemed to me impossible that they could exist without each other. So that began the next whole stage of my journey, the next piece of the jigsaw puzzle, which led me eventually to New York and to study the Chekhov work with my beloved teachers there, Ted Pugh and Fern Sloan. And, and because they were also working out of anthroposophy, even though they were teaching largely people who were not necessarily involved with anthroposophy, um, I was able to experience the spiritual dimensions of the Chekhov work and the opportunities that they gave me through a lot of the experimenting that we did with each other to be able to integrate these two streams. So gradually the, the work of the integration of the Chekhov stream of work and the speech work was able to unfold, which I've been continuing with ever since. So one could say that discovering the Chekhov method in a way was what you were aiming for, huh? in a way through Stanislavski first, then in one way or the other, an opposite impulse finding in the creative speech and speech formation impulse. And then yes, it culminated in the Chekhov method. Is this a little bit like that? It culminated in the Chekhov method in the sense that um, because Chekhov also had his roots in Stanislavski. He was one of Stanislavski's um, foremost pupils. The time that Chekhov also was struggling with, um, although he valued enormously what Stanislavski gave him and, and never lost that respect and reverence for Stanislavski, but he also, 
I suppose, the genius in Chekhov, the spiritual um, power that was working through Chekhov to bring his work through was also seeking for that more objective pole that we could, I could say would, you know, the, the best way of describing it was, is to say, well, it's the spiritual dimension of the art of acting. So through Chekhov, the, the body and the soul and the spirit um, were able to be brought into the art of acting. But it wasn't Chekhov's own personal destiny to work with the speech work, although he respected it and he made the opportunity for the speech work and the eurythmy work to come into the, the training that he offered in England at Dartington Hall. But it wasn't his own personal destiny to develop the speech work because he had that destiny to really articulate the acting process. And um, so I, I believe we've come to a time now where the, the Chekhov work has had time to mature in the world in its own right. The speech work has had time to mature in the world in its own right. And it seems to me as though the, the forces of destiny are saying now it's time for these two things to really be able to um, integrate with each other more fully. And I you... um, want to mention the work of my colleague, Sarah Kane yeah. in England, who's also in her own way, really taken up this path of the integration of the speech and Chekhov work. Can you give a few examples or how did Chekhov make it possible that spirit and body could integrate, that he could integrate it into acting? So what, what was the speciality, the tools he used to make it possible? Well, I would say that his, his central, from my perspective, his central contribution was to completely explore the stage of spiritual cognition, which Rudolf Steiner refers to as imagination. And that as a kind of foundation for the, the next stages of inspiration and intuition, which is what I feel happens when we start to integrate the work of speech formation and eurythmy with the Chekhov work. But Chekhov's work is, was starting with the human being as we are, and perhaps I might stand up and, and give a little demonstration. And those of you who are yes. watching, you might like to just participate in this if you want. You can just do it sitting. I'm going to stand because otherwise you can't see my hand. But I'm just going to demonstrate a very simple exercise that comes out of the Chekhov work where the whole purpose is to resensitize uh, the relationship between the body and the soul, because we live in a time where our relation, the relationship between the body and our inner life, the soul life, has been disconnected, and to the point we can, where we can, I mean, sports is a wonderful example of that, where you can be training the body to high levels of incredible skill and ability, but it's very often at the expense of the soul. You even have to go through great pain and push over levels of pain in order to make the body do certain things. Whereas Chekhov's method is a very different way. It's saying, what would it be to actually resensitize the relationship between the body and our inner life and to in millions and millions of minute and tiny, but very, very precise ways to give us opportunities to be able to retrain our sense that our inner life and our body are uh, um, fundamentally connected. So I'm just going to demonstrate a very simple exercise and any of you who want to join in with me can just do it sitting in your chair to start off with. And I would just ask you to, to just hold your hand in front of you and just very, very slowly begin to contract your hand into a fist and do it very slowly so that you can actually become aware that there's a sensation in that it's not just a physical movement inside that physical movement is a very delicate sensation you're wanting to become aware of that sensation that you can't even make a simple movement like closing your fist without it being the bearer of a sensation. And then if you follow that contraction deeper and deeper, you'll discover a moment where you can sense how it turns around and it begins to expand. 
the whole hand is expanding, but you're sensing it as you do it. Not just an outer movement, but an outer movement filled with an inner sensation. And you can just keep doing that. I'm going to condense the process, following the expansion as far as it will go into the infinite. And then gradually it begins to take hold of your hand again. So I'm contracting the exercise now because this one can do over days and weeks, gradually feeling that sensation taking hold of more and more of your body until your whole body is beginning to expand, but you're aware of the sensation inside that movement, not just an outer movement. And the same thing when it turns around, begin to be aware that there's a very delicate but very powerful sensation of contracting and expanding until you can gradually build that into what Chekhov calls a full-bodied expansion and a full-bodied contraction, but all the time taking it slowly so that all the time you are cultivating that sensation of what's going on in your soul when you do that. And then, again, condensing the exercise over what might take place over many days and weeks into just a few moments, to begin to be aware, once you've trained yourself in that, becoming aware of that sensation of expanding and contracting, you can begin to experience how our soul is constantly constantly expanding like at the moment I'm expanding I can just see outside the window I can see the light coming in through the window and my soul expands and as I do that I become aware oh my goodness I've forgotten for a moment that I'm being watched by people in different parts of the world and that makes me contract a little bit and and so constantly my soul is in a state of expanding or contracting and I would say that in many, many ways, Chekhov has provided many pathways, many, many different pathways for awakening this very, very subtle but very powerful connection, reawakening our ability to recognize that we cannot make any movement outwardly without it being accompanied by an inner sensing and a sensation nor can we actually become aware of an inner sensation that doesn't also express itself outwardly. And so through many, many different basic exercises, Chekhov helps us to awaken this, what I call our sensation body, our body of sensation or our body of sensibility. And which actually and this, then creates the movement, huh? which actually yeah. then creates the movement from out your sensation well, alive huh? yes yes that's right so we we become we begin to become very practiced in what lives inwardly being able to express itself in the body what lives in the body being able to be experienced inwardly i heard two keywords don i heard uh, sensing in a way and slowliness is that right? So that slowliness no. is also a, a means you use to develop a specific quality in your movement. Um, slowness, you mean slowing down? Well, slowing yes. down in order to, yes, it, I find it a helpful thing to work with a slower tempo initially because it gives us the opportunity to actually um, become aware of what's going on inside us. But of course, Cheka also gives us basic exercises for working with changes of tempo. So we can work with what he calls a slower tempo and the legato quality, but we can also move very quickly and, and become masters of, and there's everything in between being able to work with faster tempo as well. But I found in the initial stages, it's easier to develop that um, sensitivity if you're working more slowly so that you have time to pay attention to what's actually happening inwardly. Um, but anyway, I was, I was saying that for me, this is to do with the realm of imagination because 
whether it's or what Steiner calls imagination, what he means by imagination, which is that step of spiritual cognition where we begin to become aware that that behind or woven through every outer perception in the world are invisible forces, invisible dynamics that we can become aware of and start to be able to work with. And this is the realm of imagination. Mm-hmm. And I feel that the, the great contribution that Chekhov's work makes is that it provides these multitude of pathways, whether it's working with gravity and levity, with changes of tempo, with the qualities of earth, water, air and fire, everything that manifests as our material universe. By working with all of these basic things, we sensitize our whole instrument to become capable of perceiving and expressing all of the invisible forces and dynamics that exist in our universe. And then comes the next stage, having prepared our instrument in that way, we are then through Eurythmian speech, we are able to be led into the next stage of spiritual cognition, which means that we begin to become aware, first of all, to sense, I suppose, as I did that day with Shakespeare, through the language of Shakespeare, that there is the presence of a being or the presence of beings that actually are streaming through us. And that's, that is what the great next step is through the speech work, through the consonants and the vowels, through the eurythmy gestures, we begin to become aware that we're not just working with dynamics and energies, but we are also working that those dynamics and energies are themselves the expression of beings, spiritual beings, in a highly differentiated way. So again, you know, we could say, if I go back to the search, and I'm not the only actor who's searched for a spiritual dimension. I mean, I think many great actors, many of the great actors have also been searching for this, but it's very different to sort of have a kind of general idea. Yes, we're spiritual beings and um, how would we, as a, how would I like to incorporate the spirit into an art of acting? Is it just by feeling I'm a spiritual being or what? But to actually have this incredible pathway that Steiner has offered through the speech and the Eurythmy work, that the spirit isn't just some generalized sentimental or um, um, nice feeling about something being greater than the material world, but it is actually a highly differentiated specific, the specific and highly differentiated activities of many spiritual beings who are pouring their capacities and their gifts into the human being so that we can gradually become conscious co-creators with those beings. And for me, I'm not saying that people can't do it without the Chekhov work, and I'm not seeing, saying that, you know, that anybody can't do anything, but for me the path was that through the Chekhov work, the, through the imagination becoming so precise and specific, through the body of sensibilities becoming awake, I began, began to be able to feel myself more and more deeply into those next stages that are offered through the speech work and the eurythmy work. That's what I understood from what you said now, that in a way the Chekhov method allows you to make your body to a vessel to what you become able to perceive and and you start uh, developing this qualities of becoming aware and of inner sensation, which you can develop further to, yeah, sort of communication which beings you want to invite into your work. Did I understand this more or less yes. correctly? Yeah. Yes. So and actually yes. what now I understood was that Chekhov in a way did it with yeah working on the your inner experience, slowing down, making entering the space of time consciously with awareness. And then a little, how important was your rhythm for him? For Chekhov? Yes. He, has heard, he had heard of it. 
didn't you? Yes, well, it was very important. And in fact, in his in the book that's more recently come out, the more recent, one of the more recent versions of his original to the actor, where a lot of the references to anthroposophy and so on were left out. Um, in uh, the more recent, one of the more recent versions, which is called On the Technique of Acting, he speaks very precisely about how important eurythmy and speech formation are for the, for the actor. And when he started his training at Dartington Hall, he um, invited, he was, he invited Alice Crowther, who was a eurythmist and who had done both the eurythmy and the speech formation trainings in Dorna, to come and work with the actors at Dartington, um, because he, 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 he really could see that that's where the future of the art was going. But, and again, this is only my own personal interpretation, and I, you know, I'm sure others have other ideas about this, but my own sense is that at that time, both the art of eurythmy and of speech formation were still only just their own very beginning point. And Chekhov's own um, more conscious articulation of his acting process was also um, still really in its beginning stages. And um, it feels to me as though perhaps time-wise, it wasn't quite the right time yet for those streams to be aligned with each other, but he brought them into contact with each other. And I think it was the beginning of, um, of something that is now ready to evolve further. But no, he definitely, and in, in the technique of acting, he, he definitely speaks about how important eurythmy and speech are for the actor and will be for the actor of the future. And that's the thread, in a way, you picked up. That's how I understood it. Did you pick it up immediately or did it take a little bit of time? So how did you make your steps within this method? Um, ah, well, as I tried to describe at the beginning, I think it was, um, I'm not quite sure if I've understood the question, Theodore, but just for me, it was because I was, you know, there was no formal process. Um, I was just finding my way from one step to another. I would reach a certain point of um, developing a certain step and then I'd feel, ah, oh, but there's something missing, there's something missing. And then what is that? And then destiny yeah. would bring towards me the next thread, which I would then spend the next few years pursuing and trying to develop further. And I think um, I feel now at this end of my life, um, <laughs> at the end, just before, um, just before I'm ready to step into the grave, um, that I'm finally ready to be able to create a process that I feel could could be a comprehensive trajectory of, of processes for somebody who wants to go through this process. Um, but it's taken it's taken many many winding pathways yeah. to get there. Yeah. So in a way, you picked up a thread and started a life's work yes. from it. Huh? Can, yes. yeah, can you tell us a little bit about it, what you tried and where you reached it and what you found and maybe what proved wrong? Let's look a little bit into it. Um, I think um, that, that actually is a very wonderful question because it touches quite deeply, I think, on another of the great contributions of Chekhov's work to what I feel is this overall evolutionary path that's trying to unfold at the moment, um, you know, stemming from the seeds that were planted in Dornach through the work of Murray Steiner. And I think, I think if, if I could point to my central mistakes over the years, if you can call them mistakes, well, they are mistakes. But on the other hand, what else can you do when you're, you know, just trying your best to sort of go forward one step at a time. I think um, what I feel has been a fundamental problem in the anthroposophical methodologies, because they've been in such a pioneering stage, I would say that the methodologies in themselves have been somewhat primitive, not as a question of judgment or, or um, a criticism of anybody because you know, when you think of this incredible impulse that had to incarnate through Mary Steiner initially and through the first generations of people that worked with her, it's not as though they it came into a, 
a fully developed methodology or whatever, it, it all just had to be brought in whatever way was possible. And so the initial, the initial process really, I suppose, was based entirely on imitation. And imitation is a very, um, it's a very uh, difficult, it's a, a difficult path because it's very easy when you're working with imitation to unconsciously impose your will on, on a student. And I've experienced that I've done this in the past because I haven't known how else to do it. Um, and, and I know from stories of the history in Dornach and so on that, that there's often been a lot of people who've fallen by the wayside because the processes of leading somebody so that they can come through their own free will and understanding of what they're doing into these very, very lofty and incredibly esoteric um, experiences, that if the pathway to that is not articulated so that the person can come out of their own freedom and their own readiness, then very often the, um, the teacher's will can, can work into that person's will and, um, and in, in a way that isn't really healthy. And I suppose for me, um, I, I know that I've made mistakes, if you want to call them that, um, in the past through that not understanding and also my in my own development as well having had that as it were done to me I feel that you know I came out of the speech training with incredible riches that I feel I've fed me for the rest of my life but a lot of it was a lot of it was um, unconscious how it worked in me and then how it was unconscious how I tried to make other students be able to do what I, you know, felt had been done to me. And, um, and then the other great revelation about the Chekhov work was because of this incredibly intricate process that he's developed where you, you, you break down each process into, and, and, and you come into finer and finer, finer and finer perceptions of, of how you can actually create a process that each person can come to in their own way, have their own experiences of, and um, that they come to it in their own freedom and in their own readiness, as it were. And I guess it's a wonderful revelation when you're working, like in the students I've been working with at Flinders in these last 10 years, uh, which I've now retired from, by the way, I'm no longer teaching there. I'm um, about to... Uh, <laughs> about to retire into a life of um, I don't know what. But anyway, watching these students who have come with no, no uh, conscious questions at all about the esoteric levels of this work, but just when you give them an exercise, just to see how each person takes it up in their own way and comes to their own experiences, comes to their own discoveries, and it's um, for me that was the one and uh, the other wonderful gift of the Chekhov work that he has created a foundation for a methodology which will allow each person to make their own discoveries and um, come to everything in their own freedom as they're ready. So I guess I would say that if I've made well, I have made mistakes in the past, but I would say that that's the central, the central. Um, the essence, I suppose, of the, of the main mistake that I've made over my teaching life has been an, um, to find the process whereby I wasn't imposing my own will through my own ether body, imposing my own will onto the etheric body of the student and therefore taking them where perhaps they weren't quite ready for. So, Don you describe it in a way that you went to, were struggling for a solution to find the path from bringing form, yeah, which can be imitated mm -hmm. either through your will or through your being an example, whatever, towards opening doors, yeah? Yes. Opening yes. the access to their own creativity and developing the trust that things can be found in there, which are still carry the truth you want to bring. I think mm. that's the path you were trying to walk. Yes. And you, 
and somehow also a f you made a few steps. I, you wouldn't allow me to say successfully, but you found a few bricks on this path. And yeah, what helped you? What, which helpers did you find to go there? Hmm, which helpers? Of any kind. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I, um, I suppose I always, I always come back to that wonderful, um, that wonderful sentence of, I think it was Bernard of Chartres, who said, you know, we are like dwarfs, speaking about the great, you know, the great Greek philosophers and so on that had just been rediscovered in medieval Europe when medieval Europe thought that it knew everything and then suddenly this great influx of wisdom from before um, Christianity emerged and, um, and that led to another whole stage of development for the scholars of that time, the scholastics and, and, um, and but Bernard de Chartres has said, I think it was him, uh, we are like dwarfs standing on the shoulders of giants and we see as far as we do only because of the view that they give us. And so I, I feel like that about my work. I don't know what I've achieved or haven't achieved. I, I'm mostly aware of the sort of failings and <laughs> inadequacies along the way, um, the stumbling from one thing to another. But what I am also aware of, like with that original experience through Shakespeare is that all through that time, I've been given teachers, wonderful teachers, and, um, and each teacher has uh, contributed and been one of the giants on whose shoulders I'm able to stand. So anything, whatever I think, whatever, whatever ha I have been able to achieve, whatever that is, and I still feel it's only scratching the surface of, of everything that is still to come, um, I feel it's only it's only because of the inspiration of all of these wonderful human beings that have flowed into what I what I've eventually been able to do, and um, yes, so I I've mentioned some of them. You know, my 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 speech teacher in the London Speech School, my speech teachers, Maisie Jones and Ulrika Brockman. I also feel that although I wasn't privileged to have my actual basic training with, with them, Mechthild Harkness and Sophia Walsh have been extraordinarily important. Um, and in fact, all of this work that I've now developed with um, working with the Eurythmy gestures in relation to the zodiac and the planets, all of that stems from some wonderful workshops that I was privileged to attend in Dornach with Sophia Walsh. Um, which, which planted a seed for me that, that I felt uh, she was working with the mystery dramas, Steiner's mystery dramas, but planted a seed because it was my destiny to work with Shakespeare's plays. And, and I feel that everything that I've developed since has come out of that. So, um, and then of course, my, my, my Chekhov teachers, Ted and Fern, um, and, and my students, my students who's, whose patience with me and uh, sometimes their impatience with me, sometimes their anger with me because I have overstepped the mark and been true, been too, um, you know, un unaware of how to, to help them. You know, I, I feel all of these people have been my teachers and, and the stepping stones along the way. So all of my, my poor guinea pigs who've been um, trusting enough to keep trusting me even when I couldn't be trusted um, as well as as um, as well as really helping me to see no this is not good enough I've got to but, find another way I've got to find another way but with the help one could say you was it you but no, you could say you started to work on the anatomy of the soul huh? and you started using to use the the vows and the planetary gestures how yeah Mm. What did this yeah. work bring to your acting? Yes, I call it a new anatomy of the soul, just as I call the working with the zodiac a new anatomy of the spirit. And I suppose it's because if I go back, to, because it was my destiny to come through a main team, a mainstream acting process initially, um, 
what I can now look back on and, and see very clearly is that the mainstream acting is incredibly um, skillful and um, uh, in being able to, in being able, especially after a hundred years since Stanislavski when it all began and it's developed enormously over the last hundred years, but it's become enormously skillful in being able to excavate what I would call the soul life of the, but it's the soul life of the ordinary body bound personality. And, you know, there's nothing in the soul life of the body bound personality that mainstream acting technique cannot um, help you to access. But what it doesn't help you to access is what I would call the higher levels of the human being. Those levels of the human being that are not just the body bound personality reacting to the world and carrying on with all of its, um, you know, all of its uh, shenanigans, all of its emotional turmoil and so on. Um, but what happens when the higher aspect of the human being begins to penetrate down into the astral body and begin to transform that from the inside. That uh, process is entirely, you could say there's a kind of gate completely closed between mainstream acting technique and anything that is able to come from that higher level of the human, be uh, of the human being. So, um, yes, so, um, can you give an example, a few examples of how these levels can enter into your movement, into your soul expression and yes. enrich it? So, for example, um, the one that just springs to mind immediately when you say that is, I think of the moment, for example, um, in Lady Macbeth, the moment mm. in the sleepwalking scene, when Lady Macbeth, um, in her, I mean, her, her mind is completely fragmented and she's, you know, her consciousness is split between all these different parts of herself because the boundaries of her ego have been shattered. And so she's what the world calls mad. She's insane and she's sleepwalking and she's living through all of these different fragments of her soul with no no ability to be able to find any order in them. And, you know, so to play Lady Macbeth uh, and to go into the depths of darkness that she has to enter into, both as a character consciously inviting the forces of darkness to take hold of her, to possess her, though, so that she can be capable of, of murder and and then having to bear within her the consequences of that. Now, that was a character that I started working on when I was about 17, and I've been working on it through many, many different cycles over many years. And it was a character that when I first worked on it with my um, Stanislavski method teacher, who was a wonderful teacher, but really um, it, it, it brought, I mean, I, I basically had a nervous breakdown as a, as a result of being led through the Stanislavski method into all of those dark emotions. And, and yet it is the task of drama. I remember you asking Theodore, why drama? Why acting? Why do we need an art of acting? Well, we could say, why did the art of acting come into being at all? Why did the art of drama come into being in the Greek culture? It came into being because we have this task to penetrate all of the depths and breadths and heights of the human soul, that all human experience has to be penetrated and we can't just jump over it or descend into it and be lost in it. And so, you know, as an actor, I have to be able to play Lady Macbeth and not just Maria in the mystery drama, which by the way, I was very bad at, but anyway, I had to go at it. And, um, you know, so to understand all human experience, I remember I said, yeah. this was what the being, the being came to me. If you incarnate onto the earth with the destiny to be a human being, you have to go through these things. You can't bypass them. So you have to 
somewhere the human soul has to go through the agony of a Lady Macbeth who consciously invites the powers of darkness to inhabit her and then has to bear the consequences of that. Now, as a 17-year-old or even as a 25-year-old or, or whatever, just trying to do that out of the forces of my own soul was very, very damaging. And I did have a kind of a breakdown at the time and um, it took me a long while to to get myself together again, to stagger up for the next stage of the journey. But now, for example, if I just pinpoint this one moment in the sleepwalking scene where, where Lady Macbeth um, comes, you know, that part of her soul that knows what she's done and that has to experience the agony of what she's done. And I'll just show that moment if I can. And... Um, so she's, she's, she's wandering, you know, she's, she's going through all these different fragments of herself and she's remembering all of these different moments and then she remembers the moment where she stood in front of the body of Duncan and saw the blood. She saw the blood. She's sleepwalking, by the way. And she, she hadn't realised, she hadn't realised who... Who would have thought the old man to have had so much blood in him? <laughs> Trying to wash the blood off my hands. All oh, the Perfumes in Arabia will not sweeten this little hand. And then comes the great moment in the script. Oh, 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 very precise Shakespeare is. You feel what happens in that moment. Oh. Oh. And now through the work with the sounds, in this case, the vowels, we can come to a moment where we feel this moment of greatest human pain, remorse for what we have done, this moment is held within a greater context because we can feel, and it's, as I say, very precise. Shakespeare does it in a number of his plays and characters. O, O, O is what is written in the script. And now we feel through the work with that vowel O oh, and through the work with speech formation and we come to experience that that gesture of the O, oh, that gesture of the soul to actually take hold of a moment of experience, not to run away from it, not to reject it, but to actually embrace. Because in those great, those three great O's, we feel Lady Macbeth embrace her experience and come to consciousness of what she's done. And through the work with Eurythmy and with speech, we are led from that, oh, the, the gesture in the mouth, the embracing gesture, the oh, we come to the whole body being able to embrace. And then we come to the experience that that gift of the human soul to be able to have such an experience even though it's terrifying, even though it's terrible, but what an incredible thing it is. Is it really possible, which is what mainstream would teach us, that to feel the depth of such emotion, the depth of remorse for having been an instrument in the death of another human being, that is it possible that such a sacred emotion 
the awakening of conscience from within? Is that really just a byproduct of cellular secretions of, of our biological evolution, a kind of arbitrary, um, meaningless byproduct that the human soul is capable of such things, which is what mainstream psychology would tell us. Yes, oh, it's just an emotion. It's because a certain hormone or secretion is happening in some part of the body or the brain cells are doing something. I'm not saying that those things are not happening physiologically, but to think that those physical processes are the source of such a sacred feeling, whereas what we are led to through the eurythmy in the speech is that there are high spiritual beings. In the case of the O, the sphere of Jupiter, the spirits of wisdom, as Rudolf Steiner calls them, that have the actual mission to awaken within the human soul that capacity to embrace an experience, that capacity to become wise, that, that, that the consciousness of what we have done is of what we have done is being able to wake up through the resistance that we meet with our earthly destiny and what, what earthly destiny. So through Lady Macbeth's sensibilities, meeting that reality of the blood, the blood on her hands that she can never get rid of, but it awakens within her because a higher being is streaming through her at that moment to waken her up to a greater part of herself, the greater part of herself that she tried to deny at the beginning of the play. And the wonderful thing about Macbeth, the wonderful thing with Shakespeare's vision is that we cannot deny it without consequences. And that we, that we have to bear those consequences as part of our evolutionary process in order to wake up. So, I'm just giving that as an example because as a 17-year-old as a and 25-year-old trying to enter into that degree of pain and agony without anything to hold me, just trying to dig it out of my own personal soul, it was very, very destructive. I'm not saying it would be for some... I mean, maybe there are people who can do that without it being um, destructive, but for me it was destructive because I had nothing to hold me in, whereas now I can feel, yes, there is a higher being who is watching, holding me, holding the human soul as it goes through this agony, because this is what we have to do to become human. And, um, yeah, so that's an example. And the vowels in this case, and the beings behind the vowels, they help you that you to sense it in a way that you don't have just to think it might be there a meaning yes. in it, but to yes. have a connection yes. to this realm. Huh? And yes. then you did this. I mean, I was pretty impressed on one hand when you did it, how everything changed with each O, the, your expression changed completely, but it happened also in me. Huh? So this, <laughs> yeah, I felt it, but I didn't fall. Yes. Yeah. So yes. there was, and in a way, my theory now is when from just watching, you could let go and you did not have to split yourself, not to get lost, but you could stay in contact with something which still created this connection with what is needed to stay in a sort of, yeah, to still be held. Yeah. Yes, yes. And, and you yes, use the eurythmy or the vowels or the inner orientation. You're not doing the vowels of the eurythmies, but you have an inner orientation to it to maintain this sort of uprightness despite of letting yourself fall completely. Is it like this or is it different? Yes, no, I, I think that's true. Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, again, even to, um, I, don't, I don't know whether... It's interesting because if you go again, coming by 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 working with the eurythmy gesture for Jupiter, yeah. and um, I, I don't want to try and demonstrate any eurythmy yes, gesture. Yes, do please. I, I Not everybody know. knows it. Just show it. Sure. Oh no no. Theodore. Could you show it, Theodore? I feel very embarrassed showing it. Would you be able to? No, show it yes. As a 
I mean, if you. Yes, please, just, just, just. I'm not so prepared for that. So <laughs> I'm, I'm not. But just to have a center and on the one hand circling around it, this hand you could say what you showed in the beginning, this slowly, slowly contracting, yeah, but being, yeah, yeah but bringing things with it. So the whole world, the whole earth is in this. And then on the other hand, yeah, so much connected with the heavenly spheres circling around it and them too in communication with, with each other, learning from each other. Yeah, that's part of this movement, yeah? Yes. Yeah, so just a very outer demonstration. You, I'm, you can do it much better because so beautifully connected with <laughs> I, your body. I, I, I have to. <laughs> so <laughs> now, now the, the participants must decide. You show it and then everybody <laughs> says who did it better. <laughs> because we have everything in us, so yeah, yeah. Okay, yes, so that's I, I the movement, say, and now go on. You wanted to say something about this movement. Yes, what I wanted to say that, um, you know, again, it's not possible to cover all these things, but through the basic training in the Chekhov work, um, where uh, one, of, one, of the higher, one of the more advanced aspects after you've done all of these preliminary sensitizing exercises is to be able to work with what he calls psychological gesture, which has now become, of course, a, a fairly mainstream um, technique throughout the acting profession. But um, when with, with the process that Chekhov's developed, which is that we can, we can develop a full, what he calls a full body gesture where my entire instrument is inhabited by that gesture. But then I can also learn to, um, learn to make that gesture or to discover how that gesture expresses itself in the smallest possible way. So for example, it might just be that much of an expansion. The full body version might be like that. And in the same way working with, so, so, so what I came to in, um, in my own terminology in developing this methodology was to realize um, that what Chekhov, I think, had recognized because he received his inspiration from for the full-bodied psychological gesture from Eurythmy. And I think what he came, um, uh, and, and but he was able to show how as an actor, one can, one, one doesn't necessarily go on stage showing all of these full-bodied gestures, in fact, very rarely, but um, it's possible to experience once one's whole instrument has become sensitive. So through working with Eurythmy, with that Jupiter, with that gesture for the Jupiter being, I, can, I could say that this gesture is, I call it a cosmic psychological gesture, because this gesture is the expression of the psychology of a spiritual being just as if I want to, as an earthly character, make a gesture of, I want to kill you, like Hamlet, I want to kill my uncle. That's a psychological gesture. Then I, I may not express that completely fully on stage, but it will be there inwardly in the same way. Um, but I learn to recognize how this Jupiter gesture, which is First of all, I enter the psychology of this and I feel because the, the Chekhov work has, has trained me to be able to feel what's going on inside this gesture. If I'm making this gesture, what am I wanting to do? What am I wanting to do in the world? And I'm wanting to feels as though something is orbiting, something is orbiting, something which has many cycles, many cycles of becoming. Again and again, I return to that place again in order to understand more deeply. And then, as we saw in Lady Macbeth, by, by, by working with that gesture so much, then I discover what is it that Lady Macbeth's doing when she's obsessively trying to trying to wash that blood off her hands she's in some way in some that macrocosmic gesture that we saw in its pure archetypal form has become translated into this into this tormented obsessive will these hands ne'er be clean 
And so we can feel how right, even at the highest, from the highest level right down into the, into the most difficult and tormented aspects of um, human experience, these, these great gestures can still be streaming through us. And only at the moment when the human being wakes up and becomes conscious of the I am presence within themselves, are we able to start to, to retrace that pathway, as it were, from that tormented until gradually we would become capable of carrying in our souls that, that experience of the cosmic gesture. And it's wonderful how just going on for a moment with the O, oh, because just after that terrible um, agony of Lady Macbeth, um, the remorse in her soul for what she's done. And we, we don't see her again after that moment. She commits suicide, actually. And from the ordinary materialistic perspective, you'd say, oh, it's a terrible tragedy. You know, she's, and that's the end of her. She's committed suicide. But Shakespeare gives us this incredible moment immediately after we've witnessed her agony because one person, there is one person present in that moment who has witnessed it. And, and he also is completely imbued with that oh quality. And that's the doctor. And it's interesting, he's like a kind of Rosicrucian character in the play. He doesn't outwardly achieve anything. He doesn't, we don't even know his name. He's anonymous as all true servants of Christian Rosenkreutz are. He's an anonymous character, but he carries the spiritual um, understanding of the evolution of the human soul. And having witnessed Lady Macbeth's pain, what does he say? He doesn't say, oh, how terrible, she's a murderer. Look what, she, you know, she's confessed her crime. Let's go and kill her or whatever. What he says is, God forgive us all. God forgive us all, he says, oh, 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 God for all. And so that, that moment of Lady Macbeth's O's, three great agonized O's are kind of taken up in this healing gesture of the doctor who also has the Jupiter forces streaming through him in his that, words of blessing. And we know that, means, that he will- Dawn. That means that you take the sounds, the vowels, very serious. Huh? That he uses in the words he speaks afterward, God forgive us all the O. Oh. And this allows you to connect again with this sphere. Did I understand yes. it right? Yes, yes, that's right. right. And that's, uh, yes, that, absolutely. And that's, and that's where um, the work with the sounds, the work with the vowels, um, you know, it has so many different levels of, of the dimensions that it can open up to us. So in, in the case of Lady Macbeth, it's, it's her own personal journey, what she's going through. But then um, as the doctor takes up that sound, it becomes something for the whole of humanity and for the, you know, for the, the fact that the whole human race is held in this, in this loving, embracing presence that is, that is, as the, the cycles of time that is able to, to bear with us as we go through cycle after cycle after cycle, incarnation after incarnation after incarnation, gradually trying to wake up to what it means to become a human being. Don, can you, that was wonderful. I'm really impressed. Can you, can you give was an example for similar an example with the consonant. Do you work similar with them or is it different? Um, well, no, the principle is the same, which is that, um, well, and again, I have to, to say that, that, the, that the great gift of um, Shakespeare for the English speaker is that all of this wisdom is contained with a, on some level consciously, but certainly unconsciously through his genius and through 
the spiritual being that was working through him to bring his plays to the world for, you know, for our um, mm. enlightenment. Uh, so in Shakespeare, we are blessed with, with the fact that the sounds that are, that are present in the language, and I think that's what gives his language the incredible power that it has, that the sounds are absolutely um, able to be found without, without having to try and manipulate anything, without, without you know, trying to enforce some kind of theory. It's just there in the language that you, you come to this, um, these insights about you know, the, what's, being, what's being revealed. And in the same way, I discovered that um, working with the consonants and the, the zodiac gestures, um, so again, with the with the vowels and the and the and the planetary beings, we're experiencing the whole realm of the human soul. And now, when we move into the realm of the consonants and the zodiac, we're not just working with the soul, but we're working with the actual. Um, so the soul that's experiencing everything here on the earth in its inwardness. But now we're working with the powers of destiny themselves that imprint themselves into a particular incarnation, into the particular challenges of that incarnation, because that human being has to go through that journey in order to, to come to the next stage of their evolution. So, um, so for example, perhaps I, um, I think in, in one of the, the pictures that I've, perhaps if you want to, um, Theodore, can yes. you just show the image of the, um, the Scorpio gesture with the three characters? Yes, I go there. I will prepare to wait a second. I look for the Scorpio, where are you? I should be here. Great. I go there. Here we are. Yes. So um, this is one of the images from my um, second uh, volume of the Actor of the Future called Word Made Flesh. And that's where I um, fully share my research into this work with the Zodiac and the characters of one particular play, maybe, mainly King Lear. But as a... Um, but as an introduction to that, and in order to, to, to try and make clear that working with these great archetypes is not just some generalized process, that, uh, but that here we see how the, in the background, you see the rhythmy gesture for Scorpio, and next to it, the, um, the sounds, the rhythmy gesture for the consonant S, and Again, if we take this as a cosmic psychological gesture to uh, experience that a spirit, that a spiritual beings exist in the universe whose intention it is, whose objective it is to provide a particular path of development for human beings. And underneath that main image in the background, I've got three very different earthly characters, again, from three of Shakespeare's plays. The one on your left is uh, Goneril from King Lear, and the one in the middle is Prospero from The Tempest, and the one on, the, on your right is Hamlet. And I've tried to show in that chapter, I've tried to show how this great cosmic psychological gesture of Scorpio radiates its influence radiates its gift and its challenge down into the human world and manifests in these three different characters. And how in Shakespeare's language, each of these characters is really um, created almost, uh, it's very, very clear when you go to the words, how the sound s is absolutely woven through everything these characters speak. And yet the three characters are very, very different from each other because the archetype does not express itself, obviously, in the same way, because it's, there are many, many other different factors that play into how that archetype um, incarnates into three very individual destinies. So um, I, I might just try and demonstrate a little bit in a moment, but um, yeah, 
I, I also want it to be clear when I offer these suggestions that I'm not saying this is the right way or the only way. I'm just saying this is, this is the discoveries that I've come to. And like all great works of art, um, other people will come to other discoveries and they'll all, they will all have an aspect of the great reality, great truth that they participate in. So now, for example, if I just briefly try to demonstrate, um, so we have this gesture, the gesture and Theodore, you can take over from me if I'm not doing justice to this, but we have this apparently very simple gesture with the left arm just moves out into a kind of diagonal, You'd say, well, it's not very dramatic, not a very dramatic gesture, but through our, through our sensitizing of our instrument, through the Chekhov work, we can feel that even the tiniest movement is an expression if we can awake to the sense, to the sensations that arise within us. And so we have in this gesture, pointing down towards the earth, down towards the underworld down towards, we could say, the unconscious. We have the task of the human being who incarnates under the influence of Scorpio to have to penetrate that world of the unconscious. And there are three possibilities in penetrating that world. One is that I can get dragged down into it so I can lose myself in the material world, in the world of death and darkness. I can lose myself down there because I haven't got the inner forces to maintain my balance. And then somewhere in the middle, and that's Goneril, we'll come to her in the moment, Goneril, the character from King Lear who loses herself in the forces of the unconscious. And then we come to Hamlet who has the destiny he certainly feels drawn down towards this, this darkness, this goodly frame, the earth, he says, and then seems to me a sterile promontory. So um, at the moment, I'm not working with all of the complexities of the character because I'm wanting to just pull out that one thread, the one thread so that we can see how it, how it works into the language. So, we have Hamlet who, unlike Goneril, he, yes, he is drawn down. He has, to, he has to explore the depths of his unconscious. He even says at some point in the play, I am myself, indifferent, honest. You know all the S's there. I am myself, indifferent, honest, but yet, I could accuse me of such things. For better, my mother had not borne me. So he definitely has this challenge. He has to penetrate the, the forces that would drag him down into the realm of death, into the realm of evil. He has to discover that he has it all within him. And yet, he is not like Goneril, sucked down into it. He's not sucked down into it and lost in it. He always, he always has the part of him that's striving, as he says, what should such fellows as I do, crawling between earth and heaven? He sees the higher vision. What a piece of work is a man. The beauty of the world. Paragon of animals. So he has the soaring intellect of the eagle that can, can soar above all of the earthly things. And yet, to me, what is this quintessence of dust? So notice the way that the S's, that incredible, incisive, penetrating power of the S that is able to to penetrate and, ins and um, insert itself into everything and to be able to explore it with incredible precision. And that's his torment and his torture that his head, that through his incredible intellect, he can't ever rest. He's constantly having to examine 
everything with that with that But he's not dragged down into the darkness. He's able to, or he's constantly wrestling between the light and the dark that would drag him down. And by the end of the play, even though outwardly he dies and many people die at the end of the play, but we feel that inwardly he has come to an experience of being able to sustain that higher presence within himself. And then the third character, Prospero, who also has the task of, of really having to be able to mediate the whole cosmos. His character too is woven with this, at one point where he, he's become, he has all of the magic power that can control the whole world. And he brings in the people that have done him wrong. And he's decided to forgive them. He's come to the experience that he's going to be able to forgive them because he sees how penitent they are. But all through the play, he's been wrestling with his lower nature and his higher nature. He wants to forgive. He's brought everybody there in order to be able to forgive them, but something can't let go. Though with their harsh wrongs, I am struck to the quick. He says, he wants to forgive. And forgiveness isn't that easy, as we know. We can all say, oh yes, it'd be wonderful if we could all forgive each other. But when we've been so deeply hurt, we can have these things wrestling in us. But finally, he's able, to, he's able to let go of the hurt and to recognize that he wants to forgive. And, um, but you know, the S, the way in which the S works in his speeches, he brings them all in and they're all in a daze having, having had all of their sins revealed to them. And he says, stand still, for you are spells. Notice the way the S's, how he is able to use that magic power to bring everything under his control. But the main thing that he's had to learn to bring under control is his own passions, his own, his own incredible um, passionate hatred, his bullying. He's uh, another example of an incredible... Um, like Hamlet, like Hamlet, he, uh, he wrestles with his darker and his lighter side. And, um, but by the end of the play, because he lives long enough, Hamlet dies before he's able to really come to the full maturity of what he's learned in the course of his lifetime. Whereas Prospero is able to live on. And there we see how his ability to, um, you know, this incredible stinging power that he has to be able to wound and hurt other people and to have control over them. He's an incredible bully in the first part of the play, bringing everything under his control. But the one thing he hasn't been able to bring under control is his anger, his rage that he projects onto Caliban. And by the end of the play, however, he's learned that he has it in himself like Hamlet, he says, he's able to recognize, I could accuse me of such things to a better my mother had not borne me. But what Prospero has recognized, as he says, is that this thing of darkness, feel the S, this thing of darkness he means Caliban at that moment on whom he's projected all of his own lower qualities. I acknowledge mine. So he acknowledges that the darkness is in himself. And then he's able to move into a new stage where we could say he becomes the soaring eagle, the redeemed Scorpio forces from which he's able to, to view and bring healing to everybody through the possibility of forgiveness. And he talks about at the end, he gets he, he, he divests himself of all of his magic power, this great power that he had to control the universe and bring everything under his control. 
but he's finally brought his own soul under control and he realizes that he is just in need. He's in, so in need of, without all of that power anymore, the inner power, which is very, um, which is very delicate and not able to um, control anybody anymore. It's a very different kind of power. And he says, and he offers himself to the audience and he says, and now without that power, my ending is despair. Unless I be relieved by prayer. And then notice this, which pierces so that it assaults mercy itself and ends all faults. So he's come to a different, a different quality of the S, not the, not the, um, the S that can wound and, and um, destroy, but the S that can penetrate with its fineness, the fineness of that incisiveness that can actually penetrate into the realms of spirit behind the veil of the senses to those qualities that, that the normal ego-bound personality doesn't value at all because they seem to be powerless. In the world's eyes, they are powerless. So I just wanted to give that as an example of how this great, the great spiritual challenge of Scorpio, the, um, the beings of Scorpio that shape human destinies when it's their time, when it's the time of that human being to undergo that initiation, that challenge, how those forces can then work through the sound into these three very different characters so that we, and of course there are many other aspects of the characters that then have to come to meet these archetypes. But I just wanted to give that as an example so that we can see that when we work with these archetypes, what I call these cosmic psychological gestures, in the case of the zodiac that, that really help to shape human destiny with the particular challenges and lessons that that human being is ready to undergo, then they are, um, they come into interaction with all of the other particular aspects of the character to create these three very different characters. Oh, I forgot, Goneril. Yes, yeah, so Goneril, who is the one who is actually um, drawn down into the darkness and loses herself down there. And she is completely given over to her will and her intellect to try and control the world, to try and get the power because she feels she never had enough love, never had love from her father because her father only loved her sister. He always loved our sister most. You feel the incredible jealousy in her that drives her and that that drives her down to identify with the darkness, to become lost in it. But listen to her first word, the first word that she speaks in the play when she has to come before her father and tell him how much she loves him in front of the whole court. She begins with that, sir. I love you more than word can wield the matter. So she begins with that S and um, working with that character. I came, I worked with the imaginary body of a snake, a python actually, who crushes its victims. Um, but, uh, and, and, and when that comes into combination with that S, then we feel the, um, the destructive power of the S to really manipulate and control others. Which, so, um, Dawn, yeah. what's now uplifting with that? When you did Lady Macbeth and this pain and sorrow, I really went down with you, but still feel, felt carried in some way. 
But now when you show us the S and yeah, even if you say it will go through a transformation, what is uplifting? What is, it's so different the experience I had now than before. Mm. So what, what yeah. is your gift to the audience when you work like this? Because that's, I think, why you do it. What's the gift you bring through using these? Letting the sounds come at work. Yeah. yeah. Well, first of all, I have to say that probably if, if I had that effect on you, I, <laughs> I wasn't doing very well. <laughs> I was getting, I was getting a bit dragged down into the, into the, uh, into oh. the darkness myself. There. I mean, I think in That's the course. Tempting, of the, I know. <laughs> yes, it is, and, that, and that, that is very interesting. I think that um, now that you pointed it out to me, I could say, yes, I think that that aspect of me, um, that there was an aspect of me that um, that got. Uh, bit carried away into that s because i think it should work in the same way as as we were talking about earlier with the lady Macbeth. in other words that um that uh, that, that the part of me that is consciously drawing that force down and through me of the s is um should perhaps. be able to yes but when you said in the beginning with the zodiac and the consonants, there stands the circle of destiny around you. Huh? Mm -hmm. That's not so funny. No, and I was going to say that's why I think I think when you work with the consonants, they're incredibly powerful, yeah. and so it's possible to even you know be taken over by their own power myself. No, 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 as a yes. But yes. I also, but I also feel that it's important to say in the working with the whole play that um, that and and again that's part of Shakespeare's genius as well that he doesn't necessarily show the um, you know the, the whole development is not there in one character in King Lear it's there in King Lear's own character but in the play as a whole for example through the character of Cordelia which I worked with the with the with the um with the uh, the gesture of the virgin virgo um maybe i could show that in a moment well, but, but one more so, question John. also in the play as a whole that that the redemptive power may not may not show itself within that one character's lifetime but yes um, but it will come in the play as a whole yes yes because when i understood you right you make a you discriminate between the vowels which touch more and the planets which carry the soul world huh? and the mm. consonants which have more to do with, with what one could call spirit aspect of the human being. There is a difference. Mm. So what I understand from you now is that even I myself as a yeah, looking at it must myself orientate differently towards different aspects of myself towards and feel connected with my self as a developing being. Yeah, that's where you lead me to. Mm. Yeah. Yes. And, and also, yes, I think so. And I, and I think also what you've um, made me aware of is that, um, that when we're working with the consonants and the zodiac, once, once the, um, whereas the soul is constantly changing and moving and, you know, from this moment to that moment, I might be going from A to or whatever. Yeah. Um, whereas once, once that destiny path has been chosen with the cooperation of the hierarchies before that moment of incarnation, once we've descended into that body, we can't actually escape from it. We can't just suddenly decide, oh, now I'm going yeah. to... I'm going to that's, go and be something different. So there is that's a why certain... you said, Don, Don, she said, sir, in the beginning. Yeah? The S yes. was the first thing, and then you just took it for the rest. She, she, yeah, it was yeah. there. Yeah, and you don't come out of the S anymore so easily. No, no yeah. not so easily. Yeah. And she, she couldn't come out of it at all <laughs> in, in, her, in her path in the play. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, mm. yeah. 
do you want to give one more example or do you want to show us some of the pictures you have prepared? Um, actually, uh, speaking about Cordelia, it just occurred to me, maybe I could just finish with that. If um, Have we got another couple of minutes just to finish? To oh, finish. yeah. <laughs> um, I, was, I was going to say yeah. um, one of the things that is very difficult um, for an actor, you know, it's a well-known it's a well known um, saying in the theatre that it's much easier to play the devil than to play God or to play an angel. And um, there is something incredibly attractive to an actor about those um, darker forces. And um, because they are just given to us by virtue of ha having an astral body, we don't, we don't have to do anything to have an astral body it's given to us. All of those feelings and emotions are there. And unless through the presence of the I am, a being born within us to begin to transform that. We, we, um, we, we can't lift ourselves out of them. And, um, but for an actor, just in a, a normal mainstream um, training, you know, it may be dangerous, it may be frightening, but it's very easy to access all of those dark emotions. But one of the things that is very, very difficult to access is the, um, the, the, the developing the, the, the emotions and the feelings that become possible when a human being is an evolving, evolving and evolved human being. So, for example, I have never ever seen a production of King Lear, and I've seen many of them, where Cordelia has not been um, adequately, uh, you know, it's just not possible for an actor with a normal mainstream training to know how to access the qualities of an evolved and mature human spirit, which is what she is. And she says it, Shakespeare gives her the words in the final scene of reconciliation with her and Leah, where, where after a long, long process of parting, you know, he, he wakes up and he doesn't know where he is. And then he sees her and he says, I think, I think this lady to be my child, Cordelia. And then we couldn't have a clearer message from Shakespeare as to the the power working in Cordelia because she says, and so I am, I am, she says. So we know that it's the power of the I am that is working in Cordelia, but how in a normal mainstream training, there's no way, there's nothing in you. I mean, you can't just stand there and look like a nice person. It, it doesn't do, it doesn't, it doesn't work to just stand there and look like a nice person and try and be nice, you know? because it's something deeper at work within her. And so it's amazing to think, and of course there are many other aspects I could go into, but since we're just focusing on the Zodiac, by working with Cordelia in relationship to this gesture for the Virgin, it's an incredible thing. Again, what a simple gesture, what a simple gesture the, the Zodiac gesture is. Just this, just this, yeah, you say, well, that's not very dramatic. There's <laughs> no drama in that. But then it's an incredible thing when you just try and make that simple movement, when you've sensitised your whole instrument, that even the tiniest movement contains an inner sensation, an inner um, accompaniment. So just by making, coming into that simple movement, something in the whole soul, in my whole soul, something is quiet and something... Something is very, something very pure arises that it's a sort of protective gesture of the whole solar plexus and, um, and it's a kind of a chaste, it brings you to a kind of chastity and it's not a chastity that is out of denial or, um, you know, trying to be a chaste pure person it's just something that arises purely from within and and then how it manifests in the consonants the b and the p maybe you can show um so this gesture that she has to be able to embrace her father um, when she kneels and she says oh my dear father and she um we, we feel this quality of the b that she has to be able to um, embrace him 
even though he banished her, even though he cast her out of his life because she wouldn't flatter him, she wouldn't say all the nice things to him in order to be given a big part of the kingdom, but her true love, her the reality of her love is there in that b when she embraces him at the end. And then in that p, we feel how she she invokes the powers of healing to, to come in. She says, may this kiss, can we see the, the p gesture? She says, and let this kiss repair, p, p, repair those violent harms that my two sisters have in my reverence made. So she, she, she draws the powers of the, the healing into those lips so that when she kisses him, that it will bring healing to him. But anyway, the, the point that I wanted to make is that, especially when it comes to playing a character of virtue or uh, some degree of moral maturity or even highly evolved moral maturity as in Cordelia, um, that the normal mainstream uh, uh, process of acting has nothing to help us, except, as I say, we stand there and try and look nice or <laughs> whatever. But, the, but through these gestures, through this, in this case, the Virgo gesture, we're actually, just that simple gesture awakens in us a whole incredible infinity of um, a different level of feelings, a different level of, of emotions to anything which, um, you know, which, which, yeah. which we can find just by standing there looking nice. <laughs> and Dawn, <laughs> Trying nice. Dawn, we have received a few questions. May I put them? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Just, uh, we we, we begin with a challenge. Uh, Okay, Tiffy writes, I would disagree that B has anything to do with embracing. It's more about boundaries. Mm -hmm. So, yes, now well, you. Yes, well, I think that to truly embrace another person, one has to have true boundaries. You know, we're not talking about just merging, merging in some kind of sentimental way with another we're talking about out of the power of the I am to be able to embrace another. As I experienced with Shakespeare in that first experience I told of that uh, a being that could embrace all human experience and not get lost in it, but to be able to embrace it. So I think it is about true boundaries to be able to truly embrace another is to, is to be able to, you have to have that boundary there to do it. Thank you. It's wonderful. Some, uh, I don't know the name who asked it, but you in the beginning, you mentioned that in the books of Chekhov, there's a new edition where one can find that he, his work has a relationship to yours, me. And someone was asking where one can find it, which year it was published or which book it is. Oh, I don't have it in front of me, but it's it's um, the one that I that I I know is on the technique. It's called on the technique of acting, and it, and it's with the preface by Mala Powers, and I think there's been a more recent one with a, a preface by Simon Callow, but um, that was a kind of a re a republishing of what came out originally as to the actor, but it's called on the technique of acting. And there's just a section in it where he speaks about the, um, the role of Eurythmian speech. Great. Thank you. And Anne Nicholson is asking, I think you touched it often, but maybe you could elaborate a little bit more on it. You were sometimes speaking about mainstream acting and acting, and she's asking about acting and the social art. Is acting, what dimension can it have and how is it connected with social art? Well, <clears throat> I guess, you know, when you look at um, the art of acting, um, it's, a, it's a theme that's very close to my heart because I've, um, I've always felt that those of us who have the destiny to work with acting, um, 
we are given the incredible privilege of actually having the opportunity to research the human soul and its interaction with the spirit um, through the body as it manifests through the body. And, um, and so I always feel that, that it's a kind of rehearsal, literally, where we're, we're being given the opportunity to rehearse the capacities that we need to become a human being, uh, but in a very precise way, because um, because that is what the realm of acting is. It is involving the whole realm of interaction and of what happens in the human soul um, and in interaction with others. So um, it's always seemed to me that, that, that apart from whether we get to perform on the stage in the sort of normal sense of what we think drama is, that the, that the deeper and greater purpose of all of it is to develop in us those capacities that will help us to, to more fully, more maturely, more in a more evolved way, develop the drama of our own lives. And, um, and that's what I feel ultimately um, is, is what it's all for. As I think all of the arts, all of the arts, each one has its own specific area of what it's trying to develop in the human being. But ultimately, it's my belief that the final art, the seventh art, which Steiner doesn't refer to by name, but um, I always have the sense that it is that art, that art of ourselves, making ourselves, creating ourselves in co-creation with the spiritual beings, that as an actor, that's what I'm being given the opportunity to practice, to rehearse, to rehearse, to rehearse it through working on characters, through doing this kind of research. And you have now described steps you made on your path towards uh, yeah, reaching this being a human being which lives in two worlds, the world of darkness and the, and the world of light, yeah, and starting to become able to enter the one world without losing the other one, or even experience it, it even more. And now, can you just, to finish with, maybe give us a little bit, uh, yeah, a gaze into the future, what, what, will become possible through acting? What should we, what is possible to develop if we continue this path you have shown us? Yes, well, um, I think there've been many, many seeds and, and examples of people in my you know, own lifetime and through the anthroposophical community of uh, people making these attempts and um, these first attempts in the whole evolutionary path of, of what the future art of acting might become. And, um, and my own belief is that, that, the, that the real, that, that the, it would reach its culmination when you had actors who were fully trained in the speech work, in the acting process and in Eurythmy. And, um, you know, then I think it would be possible for dramas to really be able to move through all of the dimensions of, of reality. So um, uh, I, I think that, you know, what, what Steiner has given us seeds in the mystery dramas that, that eventually um, that more and more dramas will be written, which are able to consciously explore not just the characters who are not conscious of their themselves as evolving human beings, but which drama, normal drama does so well, but those characters who are consciously working on their own evolution and having to transform, really working on the transformation of their lower aspects or their darker aspects. And to see, you know, we need more dramas. We need more dramas. I mean, Shakespeare is there for us as a, as a, um, uh, as a seed in the English language. And, but there were many, and, and, and all of these secrets are hidden in his language as I've tried to show a little bit. 
But in terms of um, the content of the plays, there was only so far that he could go within the consciousness of, of the time, you know, where reincarnation, for example, was not uh, except would have been regarded as a heresy. There was lots of things that Shakespeare couldn't develop overtly because he would have been burnt at the stake as a heretic and he needed to give us those plays. And so all of those secrets are hidden as like golden threads within the plays. But we're coming now into a time, and I think the mystery dramas of Steiner gives us a, a hint of where drama in the future could go when when it's possible to speak consciously without having to apologize for the fact that a human being has many incarnations and that what condenses into one lifetime as a set of relationships and challenges and events that we have to meet, that that is the condensation of what is still leave, left from previous lifetimes needing to evolve further and that that will also lead into the future when the content of plays can begin to unapologetically embrace those themes, then I think we, um, we will have a, a moment where the content of the dramas and the developing capacities of actors will be able to bring drama to a whole new level. I think, I think we'll, um, you know, we'll come to a, a, whole, a whole new, a, a great, I think of it as a great, um, rebirth in the history of drama. Like in, in our present history of drama, we have the three great moments. We have um, the ancient Greek, what emerged in the ancient Greek, and we have what emerged in the Renaissance. And um, I think in many ways, what's emerged in the 20th century as well, it's a, I mean, you know, we're still in the midst of it. And, but I think there will be a whole new, um, a great, a new great age of drama when all of these things will come together. The new themes and the new capacities. Yeah. Yeah. It's now very tempting to continue. <laughs> I think we are, we are just starting. <laughs> I'm not yes. getting tired from talking to you. It's so wonderful, Dawn and you're touching such a lot. And one thing came to me now, just by listening to you, that, yeah, why have we met? And you describe in a way that you develop with many, many others together, people who helped you, people on the same path, that you develop a way of how the inner being of the actor can move through dimensions in a creative way which correspond to his I am being in a way yeah and this and you train this possibility to move there you use develop techniques which invite new levels which want to be born to be part of it and my question suddenly was doesn't it need an audience which has a little bit also the capacity to swing with it to yeah and suddenly I realized that's in a little bit what we try in Eurythmy for you. Huh? How can we bring to millions of people that Eurythmy lives in us, that we can discover it, that we, everybody can a little bit develop this inner flexibility to reach out to other worlds and so on, still in the body. And that maybe these two things also must meet not only on stage, but also between people on stage and the audience, that it really can follow what you try to bring. Yeah. Mm. So that, yeah. Yes. That came to me. Yes, yes. And I think, I think all of us who are involved in these pioneering stages of these arts, um, or these new levels of the arts, um, like Eurythmy with dance and um, this new level of the art of acting that opens up. I think all of us uh, are, are equally, uh, uh, yeah, I think we, we can't do it without in some way trying to educate our audience as well. Um, and I mean, I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I feel that it's because it's, the, you know, the kind of sensibilities, the kind of sensibilities that enable somebody in the audience to actually 
experience the things we've been talking about if the actor is able to reveal them or the arismist is able yeah. to reveal them, then those, those sensibilities are not cultivated by our normal culture. In fact, uh, our normal culture has, is completely deadening to those sensibilities. So, yeah, so I think we're just yeah. at the beginning of, um, of exploring how can we do that. Yeah. yeah. And I think and, it's one of And I mean, that's, uh, there were also the question, Dawn, where can, you are retiring, who is carrying on? How, where can we contact you? Huh? And there <laughs> you have this wonderful website. It's start, just starting to come to life, I think. But there are w wonderful people uh, taking up what you bring. That's the Heartfire Center for Speech and Drama in Australia. And there you have a description of the components of you have been spoken about, the Chekhov acting methodology and the creative speech part and the eurythmy. You offer training. You speak about a four-year training and everybody interested uh, to join should contact you to make it possible that it can start. You are offering training, shorter courses for adults. You are offering trainings for teachers, yeah, how for their acting with their students. And you offer also training for personal development. And there you also find on the Heartfire Center website the contact details. Yeah. And yeah, it's just wonderful. And what I would like to show briefly is that on Eurythmy for You, if you go to eurythmyforyou.com and choose the English pages, you find a lot of uh, themes on Eurythmy and you find the interview show where you find more interviews to, co to come next time about Eurythmy with animals by somebody who is working a lot with this theme and you find many many videos on our in our Eurythmy school basic elements uh, vowels, consonants, yeah, we did improvisations, the Eurythmy River Quest concert and so on. Just feel free to look around and if you want to support Dawn's work and the work of their students who want to carry on, don't hesitate to, if you liked what we did, to donate and we did do it this way that you go to our site, uh, you find the donation page yeah, and we pass it on. There are some more questions but I mean I pick one out and you can say yes or no Dawn. Huh? But I think it would be you can say no <laughs> but you're free. But somebody's right. Yeah you're right. You showed us so beautifully some gestures how you integrate them into your play. Are there also gestures on Pluto, Neptune and Uranus, mm -hmm. which are, or do they not exist for you? And maybe if it's fun for you, show us a little bit to finish with and then we can quietly close off with. What do you think? Well, I've, uh, in my um, last two books, I have explored that a little bit and I changed my mind about some of my ideas between the third and uh, between the, the second to last book and the last one that's just come out. Um, but no, definitely it's one of the things that I've taken a great interest in is, um, you know, thinking, well, it can't just be that some of the planets up there or, um, uh, you know, are spiritual, are the expressions of spiritual beings. And then there are others that are just lumps of matter up in space. Um, but have no beingness. So if everything has being, if the whole universe is consciousness and being, then that must include um, also those more recently discovered planets. And I guess the, the, where I've got to in my own um, thinking about it is that, um, that these three more recently discovered planets, um, they have been discovered because human consciousness, I mean, they've been there all along, of course, but human consciousness is ready now to, to start to consciously work with the forces and the beings that are at work in those planetary spheres of 
Uranus and Neptune and Pluto. Now, um, I don't know, Theodore, as far as I know, um, there haven't been, um, Steiner did not uh, suggest Eurythmy gestures for those planets, but um, I guess in my own research, I, I came up, I came to that edge. My question was, well, there are these planets which haven't been included, are not included in the classical system of planets and which now human consciousness is awaking, are awaking, is awaking to. But there are also vowels in the octave, what I call the octave of the vowels. There are vowels which also have not been included in those, um, those um, you know, the, the traditional sequence of vowels, including the, the main diphthongs of I and Al. And so I just spent a lot of time researching, um, you know, as far as I could as a non-astrologer <laughs> and a non-astrosophist, but what I, reading what I could and understanding what I could about those three planets and, and then working with the vowels, um, three of the vowels, or two vowels and one diphthong of the that are outside of the range of the normal octave. And so I have finally come to the conclusion uh, at this point where I've got to is that the is that the U, which we don't have in English as the pure vowel, the U, but we have it in English as the diphthong U, U, but also the other way around, the we, we, we. So the tongue and the mouth pivots around that U, 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 U. That whole vowel I feel is connected with the, uh, I feel is connected with the uh, sphere of Uranus and um, I've spoken about that in more detail in my last two books. And the same with the er. Uh. So in English, we don't have the umlauted er, uh, but we have the diphthong er, uh, er, uh, er. Uh. And I've come to the, which is also the longer version of what we call in English, the neutral vowel, the er, uh, er. Uh. And um, so I've uh, explored that and come to the conclusion that that is possibly connected with the um, being of Neptune. And also that the diphthong oi is connected with Pluto because the oi, which has this sort of, it's like it has to go through the death into the resurrection. And we have it in words like poison and joy, you know, this oi, this, and so those, that's where as far as I've got to, but I'd be really interested if anybody else has, um, has uh, come up with some thoughts about that. And um, in my books, I've um, explored that in relationship to the Shakespeare characters as well. And um, uh, one or two other things. So yes, so that's, that's my research, but I, I, I did um, reverse my, my thinking between book two and three of um, the actor of the future, between volume two and three, I changed my mind about the about the relationship of the particular vowel and the planet. And um, okay. so I thought, well, it's all in the spirit of research. It's all in the spirit of research. And so one um, will never come to the end of it because as Bottom says in Midsummer Night's Dream, it hath no bottom. Yeah, but you try to, to continue you have just published, that's not the a cover of the book, but just a picture I took out of it, the Act of the Future, Volume 3, yeah? It yes. came out a short time ago. And you are already preparing, speaking about, you, you even want to reach the sphere of the spiritual beings behind uh, this sphere, preparing Volume 4, so you are busy. And this book is out more books are coming and these are available for your basic work you have mentioned them a few of them the art of acting word made flesh and it's also a dvd series out which you can uh, yeah, buy on the market and don it's just so great that you share all this experience with us I hope many people can yeah, he hear from what you have to bring and want to join your initiative and 
Dear people in the audience, don't hesitate to pass on what Dawn tried to share with us. And don't forget what Dawn said in the beginning, what's behind of all, love. Yes. A call for love. And you followed it. Thank you, Dawn. Thank you, Theodore. Thank you so much for this opportunity.